Good morning and welcome to Community of Joy. To those of you who are with us here in person and to those of you who are with us online, we're delighted to have you here this morning. This morning, God calls us to be the people of faith in the midst of meaninglessness. In the midst of meaninglessness, God calls us to meaning. Out of brokenness, God calls us to wholeness. Out of divisiveness, God calls us to community. Out of tears, God calls us to laughter. Out of self-centeredness, God calls us to love one another. Out of unfaithfulness, God calls us to faith. Out of death, God calls us to life. And we will say to our children, come with us and worship God, who has created and is creating in our midst. Come with us and keep covenant. In times to come, we will tell our children, once we were slaves, but now we are free. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people. Out of death to resurrection, out of chaos to rebirth, out of unfaithfulness to faith, praise God for these wondrous gifts. Let us worship God this morning. When the best of me is barely breathing When I'm not somebody I believe in Hold on to me When I miss the light The night has stolen When I'm slamming all the doors you open Hold on to me Hold on to me Hold on to me When it's too dark to see you When I am sure Let's pray. Lord God, we are grateful for this day that you have given us, for the opportunity to be here together with one another, both in person and online. Thank you for your presence in our lives, for the promise that you will hold on to us, that when the night seems too dark or when the weight seems too heavy, you are there and you hold on. 
Thank you, O oh God, for always being present in our lives, for carrying us when we don't have the strength to go on our own, for walking with us in each day of the journey, for encouraging us when we're down, for lifting us up when we're struggling, for holding us fast and never letting go, for saying to us again and again, I love you, I love you, I love you. Thank you, O oh God, for all that you are and all that you do in our lives. Watch over us and keep us and inspire us and help us to live our lives in a way that makes a difference in the world for your sake and because we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Some of you might be wondering where Pastor Sharon is today, and just to let you know, she's not homesick. Uh, she's, uh, thankfully, uh, she and the girls uh, left early this morning to have a couple of days together, uh, anticipating the time when Emma's going to be moving south to Florida, so she says, and uh, uh, her house gets put on the market next week, and that's been particularly hard for Sharon to wrap her mind around all of that, and so... Uh, she jumped at the opportunity to spend a couple of days with the girls because the um, restaurant that they work at is closed on Mondays and Tuesdays now uh, and Wednesdays, so they're able to have a couple of days to get out of town, and they took advantage of that. I want to thank uh, Kelly Fagans and uh, Walt and Karen Townsend, Jean Talls, Grace Murdoch, and Pastor Sharon for serving a hot meal yesterday at God's Kitchen uh, on our behalf to... The, the residents of our community who came to be blessed and were blessed by that hot meal. You know, sometimes we take a hot meal for granted. You know, if we want to have a hot meal, we can have a hot meal, right? You know, we have a stove. We have an ability to do that. But not everybody in our community does. And I was reminded of that Tuesday when we were leaving from the showers and there's a couple that comes that lives in their car and they've been living in their car for 18 months or so, and they popped the hood and got some aluminum foil wrapped things out of the, the back seat and put them under the hood. And uh, I, I realized what they were doing. They were cooking dinner. So we said to them, hey, what's for dinner? And it was tater tots and chicken nuggets. And that's how they were gonna, they were gonna drive around until the meal got cooked so they could have a hot meal. So thank you for being ones to, to be a blessing to others uh, in our community. Um, just to let you know, I uh, got a text from Tammy Brown this week, and I am always delighted to get these texts and these ideas from you of ways we can do something as a church to make a difference and, and encourage people in our community. You know we're faith-based partners at Pinehurst Elementary School, and uh, this week, Heather, in the office, you're going to see this sign and a big old pumpkin that Tammy Brown and her granddaughter Nora uh, got, and uh, we're, it's written on it, uh, we are grateful for, or we are thankful for, and a couple years ago, we did this as a congregation. The youth gave pumpkins to each family and encouraged us throughout the, the month of October to write on it what we're thankful for. And it was so meaningful. And Tammy said, you know, that might be an encouragement to the, the staff at Pinehurst if we would do that. So she, they got the pumpkin, and this says, thankful pumpkin, what are you thankful for? And uh, grab a pen and tell us what you're grateful for today with gratitude from your friends at Community of Joy Church. So that's going to show up in the office this week. They don't know it. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, the new principal will allow us to do that, uh, and it, hopefully it's a blessing to our Pinehurst friends. And across the top, uh, we're going to write, uh, we are thankful for our friends at Pinehurst Elementary School to start it off, because we are. So thanks, Tammy, and thanks uh, to uh, Pastor Sharon for <laughs> writing more legibly than I would have on that, uh, that pumpkin. Today, our scripture passage uh, comes from Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 18 and through the end of the chapter, which is verse 31. Hear now the words of God. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? 
Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heaven like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them to nothing. They hardly get started, barely taking root when he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk. And not faint. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Did you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is free And the good news is I know that He Can do for you what He's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus And let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah Hallelujah the past to disappear let me tell you about my jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who can work it all for your good let me tell you about my jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sin that he Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is free And the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me Let me tell you about my
You know, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch where you have come. It is just absolutely amazing and awesome to see how you're maturing and, and finding yourself and the confidence you have, Carly. Uh, what a blessing and what a neat thing for us to sit front row. You know, there, there's probably going to come a day when we say, remember her? <laughs> she led music in our church before she lived in Nashville or wherever it is you're going to end up. Wow. Incredible. Greg texted me and said, uh, <laughs> we have this way of communicating from the back with, uh, uh, that I forgot to announce that we are taking money for script cards today. Uh, so if you uh, want to get script cards, script cards are gift cards. We use them for Walmart, uh, Foodline, Acme, local things like that. It's a great way to support our youth, uh, and it's free money for them. So we would love to have uh, your check today, and you'll get the cards next week, and uh, you can spend them like cash. Um, so we'd love to have your support. In her young adult years... Amanda, my aunt Amanda, was a third and fourth grade school teacher. She was well liked by her students because she had a certain way with children, a way that made learning fun and exciting, and a way that made children feel like they were special. Amanda received honor after honor for being a model teacher in Caroline County. She had a lot going for her. She was well-liked and widely respected as a school teacher, and not only was Amanda a, a committed school teacher, but she was very active in the local community in Caroline County, in the Denton and Ridgely area, and in her local Church of the Brethren, the Ridgely Church of the Brethren. At her church, Amanda taught Sunday school, was a member of the church board, and was president of the Ladies Fellowship Group for many years. Amanda was always on the go with lots to keep her busy. She had become a widely respected leader in the community and in her church. Even when her husband Henry became ill and had to stay at home resting most of the time, Amanda kept as busy as she could, teaching third and fourth grade and Sunday school, as well as staying active in the community. As the years went on, Henry's condition deteriorated and he needed more of Amanda's time and care. She was able to continue teaching school and did so until she was of retirement age. Henry died shortly after Amanda retired and yet Amanda kept busy then tutoring students and teaching Sunday school. Until one day, and it wasn't like all of a sudden, it was coming on and Amanda had started to notice that she was not able to do some of the things that she was able to do previously. One day she came home from the doctor's, uh, a doctor's visit and had been diagnosed with a crippling disease, multiple sclerosis. And it was slowly taking over her body and limiting her ability to do things. Little by little, Amanda found it difficult to do things she had done all her life. She had to sell her beloved chickens and guineas because she could no longer go outside to take care of them. She crawled up and down the steps of her home to get to her bedroom at night because she no longer had the strength or the balance to walk up the steps, even holding on to the banister. Eventually, she had to move a bed downstairs because she could no longer crawl up the steps at night. She had to give up her driver's license because she was no longer strong enough to turn the steering wheel. She had to give up teaching the Sunday school class that she had taught for more than 30 years because she no longer had the energy to devote to preparing the lessons. 
And finally, several years later than it might have been, Amanda had to sell her beloved farmhouse where she had spent all of her married years. She moved from a large 10-room house out in the middle of a field, field where the only thing you could see out the windows were fields and pine forests to a one-story, four-room house in town where all you could see out the windows were busy cars, were busy streets with cars going back and forth or houses from the neighbors. Amanda, once a strong and active leader in her community, was now limited to doing only the things that she could do from her four-room house. And really, that was from one room, pretty much, her living room. Amanda, once an active leader in church, was now forced to worship at home. And that was back before worshiping at home and online was a thing. Her church, though, did have taped services, and somebody dropped them by after services were over so that she could pop it in the cassette tape player. Remember those? That was back before CDs. <laughs> and uh, she could pop it in and listen to the service that way. Amanda, once a care provider for her husband Henry and for hundreds of young school children, was now the one who needed constant care. Amanda's story is much like the story of the children of Israel. They were once a blessed and prosperous people who found favor in God's eyes. They had been delivered out of captivity in Egypt and led through the wilderness to the land flowing with milk and honey that God had promised their ancestors called the promised land. The children of Israel were the people led by God's anointed from the house of David. And they were worshipers of God. They had found favor in God's eye and eyes and were a strong and blessed nation. They believed themselves to be God's chosen people. The children of Israel were a strong and prosperous people until King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came into the land of Judah and took King Jehoiachin captive, exiled all but the poorest people of Jerusalem. Not only did King Nebuchadnezzar exile the people of Jerusalem, but he destroyed the temple of God and set up a ruler over the land of Judah, which was a puppet for the Babylonian Empire. All of a sudden, the children of Israel were faced with a crisis of identity. They were once considered God's chosen people and found their identity in living in the promised land, worshiping God at the temple and in being ruled by a descendant of the house of David. Now these chosen people were taken out of the promised land. The temple was destroyed and the ruler of Jerusalem was a pawn of the Babylonian Empire. This once strong nation was now under the rule of a foreign government, and some of the people were being held captive in a strange land. The strong nation of Israel was now in a weakened state. Amanda was physically weakened by this crippling disease that overpowered her body. She could no longer walk even two steps. Instead, everywhere she went in her house, she had to crawl. Sometimes she couldn't even get herself up from the floor into the chair where she often sat. Many were the times that I would stop by to visit her and she would be sitting on the floor eating her supper that her sister had brought by. And because of the inability of her body to help, her sister was unable to get her up and into the chair or it would have been also too hard for Amanda to get out of the chair to crawl to wherever she needed to go or to crawl uh, to use the restroom. And that was a struggle. 
Amanda's weakened condition could have caused her to give up on life. But she found hope in each new day. For Amanda, encouragement and hope was found in looking at the past life that she had lived and recalling the blessings that she had experienced and the places where she had seen God's hand in her life before the disease. And also in dreaming about how life would be as soon as she got her strength back. Because she always talked about how she was going to get her strength back. That it would be coming back and she would be healed and, and she would find the strength that she once knew. She stayed as independently as she could. Often when I would stop by to visit her, she would tell me of all the things she was going to do. She had a local carpenter install a ramp with handrails on each side so that she could walk up and down the ramp outside on nice days and get her strength back. But when that was done, she didn't have the strength to open the sliding door that led out to the ramp. And so as is often the case with people who have limited abilities or who experience limitations in life, they, they're able to create ways to compensate for that. And so Amanda, in her mind, and, and was able to communicate this pulley and rope system to open this sliding glass door, and she was able to do that. But she never walked up and down that ramp because she didn't have the strength to do it. In the midst of what could have been a very despairing time for Amanda, she found great strength also in prayer and in recalling verses of the Bible that she had committed to memory as a young woman. And she found strength in her relationship with God. I never went to visit Amanda when she complained about her limitations, never once. Did I hear her complain? She was always focused on the future. When I get my strength back, this is what I'm going to do, she would say. And then she would tell you whatever it was she thought she was going to do. Like Amanda, the Israelites had external limitations placed on them by a foreign force. They were held captive by a power outside their own control and they found themselves in a weakened state. The Israelites, who once were a strong nation ruled by a descendant of the house of David, were now ruled by a puppet of the Babylonian Empire. The Israelites, who once worshipped God at the great temple, now had no such place to worship God, and furthermore were surrounded by people who had other gods. The Israelites were once, who once lived in the land that was promised to their ancestors were now living in a land that was not their own. These conditions caused them to be in utter despair, feeling that God had forsaken them and no longer cared about them or was not listening to their prayers. But in steps the prophet Isaiah in the passage that I read this morning. Isaiah wants to encourage the people, who's his people, who are in exile, and he asked them these questions. Why do you say, O Jacob, why declare, O Israel, my, my way is hid from the Lord, my cause is ignored by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Isaiah asked these questions in an effort to get the people of Israel who were in, captive in a foreign land to think back to the time when they were in the promised land and to think back and remember the countless times that God had been there with them and for them. After these initial questions designed to get their memories working and thinking about the ways in which they had encountered God in the past, Isaiah speaks these words of encouragement. He says, The Lord is God from of old, creator of the earth from end to end. God's wisdom cannot be fathomed. God gives strength to the weary, fresh vigor to the spent. 
It's Isaiah's intent to help his people remember the past and God's favor toward them. Isaiah wants his people to recall that God is the creator and sovereign over all the world. Isaiah hopes that the wearied exiles will find encouragement and strength in remembering God's faithfulness in the past. As they remember God's faithfulness in the past, Isaiah speaks these encouraging words to them. Youths grow faint and weary, and young people stumble and fall. But those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Through waiting, through trusting, through hoping in the Lord. And those three words in various translations are used. Some say those who wait on the Lord. Some say those who hope on the Lord. And some say those who trust in the Lord. And so I'm just saying through doing any of those things, through hoping, waiting, or trusting in the Lord, the wearied exiles will one day find strength. That's Isaiah's message. It's the message he wants his people to hear, and it's the message he wants us to hear as well. Although in the shadow of the Babylonian Empire, the Israelite people appear to be faint and weary, Isaiah is telling them if they will put their hope and trust in God and wait on God, they shall again find strength. Compared to God, the Babylonian Empire is nothing, Isaiah says. Com uh, strength comes from trusting in God, their creator and sovereign of all the world. And then Isaiah uses this image of an eagle. to provide and to convey a message of hope to his people, to the weary exiles in the land of Babylon. The eagle is a large predatory bird that's often thought of as the king of the bird kingdom. You've seen them, flying high above in the sky, circling. Maybe you haven't even noticed them and you hear the sound of them calling to one another and you look heavenward and there they are way up in the sky, effortlessly, soaring, flying, looking down. It's hard for you to see them up there, but it's easy for them to see you. One envisions this large bird standing on the ground, and I've seen this happen many times, and maybe you have too, because they're very prevalent around here. You know, it used to be when I was a boy, you hardly ever saw an eagle, and if you saw an eagle, it was a spectacular thing. And now, if, if you see an eagle a week, it's no big deal. They're everywhere. But I've seen them standing on their ground, and when they stand on the ground, they're a big bird with wings in the ready position and with the quick swoosh of their wings, they're airborne. It's amazing to watch them launch. Once airborne, the eagle soars to the heights of the sky with wings outstretched, surveying the land that is below, watching carefully for their next meal. I remember one time I was turkey hunting and we had a stuffed decoy, a hen that my friend raised and it was, he taxidermy stuffed it and we had it out in the woods and the field just ahead of us and uh, we were calling and sitting there and we had a face mask on and here comes this bald eagle and he's coming right at me because he saw the, the, my eyes, you know, that's all that was exposed and they, they, he caught that and immediately as I realized he was coming at me with his talons kind of reaching toward me, I went like this and he veered off at the last minute because he realized that it was not his next meal. But that was a scary experience. <laughs> They're big birds. The image of an eagle mounting with wings uh, the image of, a, of mounting up with wings as eagles is the more traditional translation of this text. But the Tanakh, which is a Jewish society's publication, 
uh, it's a translation of the Hebrew scriptures that the, the Jewish people did. And it renders this verse in this way. It says, but they who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength as eagles grow new plumes. Plumes are feathers. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall march and not grow faint. And when I first read that years ago, that image, the power of the image of mounting up with wings as eagles wasn't the same as in the, as an eagle grows new plumes. That, that, that image just didn't have the power for me. But after reading it many times and reflecting on the image of eagles growing new plumes, that image became more powerful for me. Maybe even more powerful than mounting up with, on wings as eagles. Because this rendering of the verse alludes to a popular belief that eagles regain their youth as they molt and grow new feathers. Molting is a process that birds go through when they become, uh, when they grow from young to adult. They molt their feathers so that they can take on the new feathers. If you ever see a young bald eagle, it doesn't have a white head. It gets that later. And it's not like us, it's not that our hairs grow gray. It's that they lose their feathers one by one and the white comes in. It's what molting is. And that molting process is a process also by which adult birds periodically shed the outer, tattered, dull feathers that they've developed because they've been around for a long time and take on and grow new ones and become beautiful once again. Right now, my chickens that I got a year ago are molting. I walk in the chicken coop and there's feathers everywhere. It looks like they've had a feather pillow fight. Or it looks like, you know, uh, they've been after each other. But what happens is, after a year old, these, the chickens shed their feathers. And some of them look really rough. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen a chicken that's molting, but they have these little pin feathers that are starting to grow in. And, uh, you know, where they were full, next thing you know, you, you don't quite see the skin, but you see these little pin feathers all over them, and they don't have the same fullness that they had. And they're really ugly <laughs> in that state. In fact, the other night I, I was in there in the dark and I don't have a light in my chicken coop and I reached, they were on the roost and I reached out to pet one and was kind of startled because there was no fluff, there was no uh, soft, it was very prickly. It was like a three-day-old beard if you've ever done that or, you know, when you didn't shave your legs for you women that, uh, you know, and, and rubbed your hand on it. It, it, was, it was a startling feeling. It wasn't what I expected. Uh, but that's what happens when they molt. By rendering this verse, but they who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength as eagles grow new plumes. I envision the eagle's appearance changing from looking old and torn and tattered, wind-beaten, to looking bright and shiny new and elegant. There is for me an image of transformation that's present in this rendering of the text, in this translation of the verse. They who uh, trust in the Lord shall renew their strength as eagles grow new plumes. As eagles grow new plumes also conjures up for me a sense of near inevitability of something changing. For the exiled Israelites, this might have been understood as saying that just as the eagle grows new plumes, so too shall you who trust in the Lord renew your strength. One day God would restore them to a new glory. One day God would lift them out of captivity and set them free. For Amanda... 
the new plumes came as she continually reevaluated her own abilities and accepted her limitations while living life to the fullest despite those limitations. Even in the midst of her weakened physical condition, Amanda recognized that life could be lived in such a way that she could enjoy the things, even the few things, that she was able to do. Strength in its fullness is not found in the physical sense, but in Amanda's capacity to offer others her love, faith, and cheer. Despite Amanda's limitations that kept her sitting in a chair almost all day, every day, she found ways to encourage others with a smile, a brief note, or a telephone call. Here are some of the words that she wrote to me while I was in seminary many years ago. Hello, dear one, she said. God has given us another beautiful day. We rejoice and give thanks. She also wrote, thank you for your continued daily prayers. I return them in your behalf. May the golden glow of happiness fill each moment of every passing day. I think of you daily. Another time she wrote, like costly perfume, the smallest of it lasts a long time. Your visits inspire and refresh me. You have given me so much. Let me embrace it always. And finally, may you be blessed with peace Joy, happiness, love, friends, and an abundance of spirit from above. Do you hear the beauty in her words, the way she, she had a way of crafting? You would have never guessed by reading those words that she had endured what she endured. Amanda found strength through hoping, trusting, and waiting on the Lord. As we feel weakened by the limitations that are placed on us, we too can find renewed strength through hoping, trusting, and waiting on the Lord, just as eagles grow new plumes. Just as eagles soar on wings that take it high above the earth. Being a pastor has been the calling of God on my life. It isn't what I planned to do. Yes, I went to seminary, but I felt the call to ministry when I was in college, and I wasn't in college to be a pastor. I don't know what I was in college for, to be honest. I was in, I was in, actually, I do know. I was in college to avoid going to work because in 12th grade, I wasn't going to college. But then when graduation was staring me down the, the, the face, I thought, I don't want to work full time i got to go back to school, and I hate it, school. So I said, if I get accepted at college, I'll go for a two-year degree. And then I got my two-year degree, and I thought, I'm not done with this school gig. I don't want to work full-time. I'm going to do two more. And then in the two more, somewhere in the third year, I felt this strong call of God. And people in my church started telling me that, you know, you need to be a pastor. You need to be a pastor. And I thought, well, okay, let's explore that. If I get into seminary, I'll go. Well, I didn't know that all you had to do was have money to get into seminary. <laughs> I didn't, not that I had much money, but, uh, and I did get out with a, fa a fair amount of debt from seminary, but um, I went, and I felt God shaping my life and calling me toward this. And now I've dedicated my life to being a pastor, to following Jesus, because that's what was most important to me, following Jesus. And it's been 31 years now. And today, on this date, 1999, October 3rd, 1999, when Sharon and I were inducted as the pastors of Community of Joy, then Community, or Salisbury, Community Church of the Brethren, we've been here 23 years. Today, this, today starts year 23 here. In that time, there have been many joyous moments, deep connections forged, significant community impacts made, but there have also been a handful of discouragements, moments where all I wanted to do was throw my hands up and throw the towel in. I quit. I give up. I'm tired of this. 
change course, do something different, get my weekends back, be released from the challenges of being a pastor. Last Sunday was one of those days. I don't know why it was so. Maybe it's the continuance of COVID and the small crowd that gathers here each week. Maybe it's the weight of this calling. Maybe it was the desire to see more of you engaged in mission through the church. Maybe it's the constancy of needing to figure out what I'm going to preach each week. That's a huge thing. And then the task of developing the sermon. Maybe it's feeling stale and old. (laughs) Whatever it was, it was working on me. It was really working on me at lunchtime. So Sharon and I decided that we would not do our typical Sunday afternoon nap. We would go off and explore in our community. And so we went to the Windmill Vineyard where Carly had sang that morning. And we enjoyed our time there sitting outside in their little courtyard that they've created. And they have these uh, colorful wine bottles uh, hanging on... um, uh, yeah, tie rods or uh, metal, metal rods that, um, rebar, is, that's the name I was looking for. Uh, and it's beautiful, you know, it was just beautiful to sit there and the chickens were coming around and pecking at our feet and, and trying to see if we dropped any crumbs from what we were eating. And, and then we went from there to the boardwalk. We hadn't been to the boardwalk all summer long, but we went down to the boardwalk and we did it all. You know, for me, a trip to the boardwalk is uh, Coors Brothers ice cream and Fisher's popcorn. And I would have gotten a wrapper if they had been open, but they weren't. You can have the Thrasher's fries. We had French fries at, uh, off the food truck at the winery, and we didn't really need Thrasher's. And I'm not, Thrasher's are okay, but, you know, I'm not going to stand in line for those. But I will stand in line for Fisher's. It's the sweet. It's the sweet, you know. And then we went to Sunset Grill where Emma was working and we sat at the bar where she was working and we had appetizers. And I don't know if you've ever been to Sunset Grill, but their mahi finger appetizer are really fabulous. And so that was our afternoon. And all of that helped. But it didn't take away the feeling of discouragement. It just pushed it back a little bit. Monday morning, the discouragement came back And uh, I began to think of what else I might do with my life. How I wanted to spend the remaining years of life I have. And you know, when you get past 50, (laughs) it's not that old, but yet you start to look at life a little differently. And I'm getting closer to 60. And so, you know, I'm starting to look at life a little differently. And so what do I want to do with the years that I have left? What kind of impact do I want to make? And... um, Then it came. It came as it does every day and has for years. I have a friend who's a life coach. Um, That's the only way I know to explain what he does. He just comes alongside people and encourages them in their life. And he's kind of like a counselor, but he's he's also helping people figure out what they want to do with their lives. He's a follower of Jesus. He might even be a pastor. I'm not really sure. I only met him one time. He's not even from here. I met him in the coffee shop downtown Salisbury when it was Main Roots. And he was providing coaching for a friend of mine. And that friend introduced me to him. And then my friend Earl, my new friend, requested me, friend requested me on Facebook. And ever since, every day, early in the morning usually, he sends me a scripture passage and a prayer. A prayer that he writes relating to that scripture passage. And on Monday, he did that just like he does every day. And when I opened the message, there was a specific message to me. This is what he said. He said, Martin, thank you for the difference that you make. I am proud of you and grateful for you. And then he shared Isaiah 40, 18 
to 31, this passage I've just been talking about. And then he wrote this prayer. What new strength do you have for me, O God, to meet my new challenges? What new wisdom, what new insights, what new aspects of my practices do you have for me to embrace gratefully? May I open and explore your new empowerment. May I be as willing and even more so to set aside what I have come to know, that I may receive what you have lovingly pr provided for me to come to know now. Work with me and within me, as you always have, that I may not be able, that I may not only be strong enough to receive that which is for me, but also to receive your new strength to release that which is no longer for me. And may I do both with truth, true gratefulness and love. You gave me eagle's wings that I might fly, fly towards you, fly with you, fly in you. May I not only trust the wings that you have given me, may I also trust the wind that you provide for me on which I will soar and in the direction from which you will send it to me to carry me in the direction you have for me to go and to do what you have for me to do. The landscape will change. You will lead me to it, and you will lead me through it, flying, running, or walking, to do whatever good works you have for me to accomplish through you, for the benefit of others, and for the glory of you. When I grow tired and my head drops down, and when I'm staring at the ground, please let me feel your hands on my face, holding me and lifting me up, lifting up my gaze that I may see your eyes looking into mine with love for me and with purpose for me and with your comforting smile beyond any other beautiful thing that I've ever seen or felt, filling, with me and filling me with everything I truly need to walk this life with you and in you and through you moment by moment gratefully. Thank you for your provision of this life and everything that's necessary to live it, and thank you even more for your provision of eternal life and for everything that's necessary for me to receive it. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for loving all of us and for including me with all of us first. And I wrote him back and said, thank you for this daily blessing. Much appreciated. Today's word and prayer touched my weary spirit. And isn't it amazing how God works in those moments when we truly need it, when we're truly at our end, when we're at that moment where we don't feel like we have the strength to continue on, when we trust, when we hope, and when we put our faith in God, He will provide us the strength to mount up with wings as eagles, to grow new plumage, to be transformed, to have new life. May it be so in each of our lives. Amen. There it is. So how do you want to talk back today? Carly doesn't. But we're good on time. God is amazing, truly, <laughs> absolutely. This past week at, at my workplace, I had the best week every single day, all week long, that I've had even before COVID at work. And there's a reason. And as tiring as it is, and then this weekend, I knew what was coming. I had an extremely busy weekend, and it even got busier as I went through the weekend. So after the end of the week, you know, I was just like feeling like, thank you, God. This was like the best week I've had in so, so long. It was awesome. But I knew, and I knew why. It wasn't, it was because of where I guess I've come spiritually to constantly be connected to the Holy Spirit instead of looking at the other me that is that worldly me that's my brain telling me what to do all the time. And so I started realizing, hey, wait a minute, you know, 
our human egos are pretty strong. They tell us what to do and everything and so forth and so on. But there's another me in there. That's the me of love that's way inside there. And I think I started thinking that real me is much stronger than that ego. It just does, makes me believe I'm not. So I started talking back to my ego because you always talk to yourself, right? You do. We all do. Why did I do, why did you do that? What did you do? So you're talking to somebody else, another you sort of thing, you know? So all this week, the way I dealt with, with everything was I, I just went to that place where I said, mm, 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 mm. God is stronger than you. God is stronger than you. So when it came to be Friday, I had just everything lined up, and my ego says to me, you know, you have worked so hard. You have had a great week. You deserve to have a weekend off. If you do all this stuff, you're not going to have time for yourself. You should have time for yourself. And I talked right back to my my worldly self and said, I see what you're doing. You're trying to take my blessings from me. I see what you're doing. I'm, I'm going to help with God's kitchen. I got a practice thing going on. I got to practice for church. I got to help a friend load up a car. And those are, that's where my blessings and the joy is at. You're not fooling me. So I'm going to do it anyway. Yesterday, I was so tired all day long. It was that kind of tired where you walk around in a stupor like, because you can't think or get your thoughts together. You're that tired. You know, we've all been there and everything. And I thought, I don't care. I'm going to keep doing my things today. <laughs> you're not going to stop me. I know you're telling me. You just got to say, oh, call somebody. You're just too tired. You're worn out. And I just tell my other self that, that one that runs the world for us, you're not taking my joy from me. I might be tired, but I got God on my side. I'm doing every bit of what I'm supposed to do this week, and I'm going to receive all the joy from that. And I did. And I'm still tired this morning, but I'm just all filled with joy. I could have said, like Carly sent me her songs, I could have said, you know what? I am so tired. I'm just, I'm just going to stay home today. Just, I'm so exhausted. I'm, mm -mm, mm -mm. So when you get that voice in your head, you have the power. And that power is Jesus Christ. Way bigger than your ego. Way more powerful. Tell yourself when you have this thought, man, I don't feel like doing that. Let, let that you that's love inside of you say, wait a minute. Why is it? Now, there's times, yes, you know, your heart may be in agreement. It's like, I am so tired and everything. And your, and your heart, Jesus Christ might say to you, yes, child, you got to do a little resting here. You're pushing yourself too hard, you know. But most of the time, our ego is all about us. It's all about what we want, what we think we deserve. Oh, I can't do and who, how, how dare this person not do this or not do this? Why am I doing everything? Why? None of that. Not for a second. It's been a beautiful week and a beautiful weekend, and I am learning how to use that power that's within me Amen. to talk down that ego voice, the one that tells me I'm not worth anything or the ones that's always told me I deserve this and I deserve that. You put that thing in place, everything's beautiful. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> That's a challenge. <laughs> That's not easy. Okay, sorry. So the past couple of weeks we actually spent in quarantine, which, let me tell you, I probably felt like your poor molting chickens and about as ornery as them too, because, you know, you just feel disheveled and stubbly, as you described. And, um... You know, you kind of lay in bed miserable for a little while, and then you're fine, but the next person in line gets sick, and they're, you're there miserable. So you're all miserable. You're not doing the things that you know you want to be doing. You're not spending the time with the people you know you want to be spending the time with. You know, and you're, you're super sheltered. But in those periods of molting, as I'll, you know, uh -huh. as you put it, uh -huh. um, you gain some perspective, you know? And it's like I'm sitting around the house, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, this could be done. That could be done. And while those distractions, those welcome distractions of being around the people that you want to be around and do the things you want to do, they distract from some of the other things you tend to ignore and take for granted. So it's like those, those moments, I've learned to be more grateful for them than I have been in the past. But... I definitely, you talked about your molting chickens, and I completely related to that. Sure, sure. Thank you. 
We all need to molt. <laughs> I mean, it's the process of transformation. Age. <laughs> what does it mean? Um, I think everybody in this room is getting older. Uh, today is my grandbaby's 10th birthday. She's been wanting that for a long time. And uh, just the other day, she was in my hands, you know. So anyway, the older we become, the more life has some impact. And how we deal with it is very interesting. But uh, one main thing. In my business, I talk to a lot of people who are in their 80s. And we get into a discussion about talking about age. And when I tell them how old I am and how old they are, they just go, oh, you're just a young kid. <laughs> you know? So age is what we... Uh, you lose your mind sometimes, too. But, uh, you know, age is just something that happens, and how you cope with it is really a personal choice and how you think about that. And I will tell you something about it. Your, your daughter going to Florida... It is a drag, <laughs> especially for your wife, you know, because I've got, biggest mistake I made in my business is vacationing a lot in Florida. My kids like Florida. So unfortunately, out of three sons, I've got two living in Florida and three grandbabies in Florida. So it ain't easy, but you just, as my daughter-in-law would say to me, just keep it moving. And I've adopted that expression because that goes a long way when things get a little crazy. Keep it moving. There you go. Thanks, Rob. Yes, sir. Any online, Tracy? Okay. Our final song. Brothers and sisters, as you leave this place, may you find new strength as you trust hope in God. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>